I went to the University of Chicago for college and um, I had a lot of AP credits and so I graduated in two and a quarter years. I just kind of got fed up with, um, with the pace of things at school and actually when I got there I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I, I, um, you know, I liked physics and I liked math and I liked chemistry and um, after about a year, I decided that actually I just liked using math to solve problems. And I met somebody who was working on his postdoctorate in physics. Actually, this was um, through sailing. I was uh, crewing for this guy on a 470. And he was kind of on the side building models and trading currency futures with his brother-in-law. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. You can build a mathematical model and then try it out and see if it works. And that seems so much more interesting than, you know, writing an academic paper, debating whether you're right or wrong. You know, two years later, you may never know. But using math to solve problems in financial markets, there's this instant feedback so I didn't really know anybody in the futures industry. Um, so I started walking around the, uh, I, I printed out a bunch of resumes and I slipped them under doors and, and um, uh, I looked in the alumni catalog at the University of Chicago and eventually I found a firm that uh, gave me a job and, um, and, and keep in mind I'm 20 years old. Um, and so this is in January of 1989. And they said, why don't you start off, spend two weeks standing next to each of the traders that work for the firm, and then we'll see how things go. And they, had, they didn't have that many traders. They probably had 12 traders. And so over the summer, we sat down again, and they said, well, what do you want to do now? And a lot of their traders were on the floor of the CBOE, and that was interesting. They had one trader on the Merck and one trader on the Board of Trade. And I decided, you know, rather than standing in the IBM pit and thinking about how to price IBM options, um, becoming an expert on one company, I thought I'd rather do something that has a more of a macro, big picture perspective. And so I decided to go in the Euro dollar option pit, which is options on futures based on three-month LIBOR, so interest rate options. Um, I thought, you know, a pit that's based on a product on the largest, on interest rates on the largest economy in the world is probably a, you know, a more interesting thing to think about. And so in, in October of 89, I went in the dollar option pit. I had, had $100,000 in a futures account, and I stood in the pit from 7.20 to 2 o'clock every day. I never took a break. And then I'd go home, and I had a Macintosh computer, and I wrote risk software. I built option pricing models. I fiddled around with volatility pricing, thinking about how the volatility term structure should look across the yield curve. And I figured out a couple things that I thought would work and then I'd go down and try them out. And it was awesome. I had a 400 square foot studio apartment. I had a Macintosh SE computer, an ImageWriter 2 printer, which is a dot matrix printer with a color ribbon. And I designed software to print out option pricing sheets that had the calls in blue and the puts in red and the deltas in black. And it took hours to print on, the, on my printer. So I'd you know, run the stuff, go for a run, come back, put a pillow on top of the printer so I could sleep, and then get up in the morning, take the sheets, fold them, go down and stand in the pit. And um, so 
I had lots of fun with it. And uh, eventually, after a couple years, I gave the firm that started me off their capital back. And in 1992, I started DRW, which consisted of me standing in the dollar option pit, and I started to hire people. And, and really, my focus was on combining the disciplines of trading and risk management with quantitative research and computer science. And that there were lots of smart people in the Eurodollar option pit. You know, there were um, lots of kids that went to top colleges. But there really weren't many people who were trying to really combine those disciplines and were standing in the pit. A lot of people upstairs building models, but so I felt that I had a time and space advantage that I was able to leverage with those tools. And so any time that you know, an order came in the pit, I had a clear sense of you know, the market's seven bit at eight, I'm seven bit at eight, but I actually think this thing's worth five. So if they come in and sell the sevens, I'm going to buy 50. If they buy the eights, I'm going to sell 500. Um, so with that philosophy, I started to build DRW, and, and I hired people with, you know, some of them with combinations of those backgrounds. That's pretty rare. Um, but generally, people that could interact with, you know, quants that could interact with traders, computer science people that could interact with traders and could interact with quants. And, and I gradually expanded into more products and, um, and just kept on going. So today, DRW, um, we employ 550 people. We have four offices. Chicago is our main office. And we still do the same thing. Um, but and, and rather than talking about the products that we trade, because we trade pretty much everything, I, I generally talk about the way that we trade. So we have three distinct types of trading. Our, we have what I call traditional liquidity providing. And so that's kind of like standing in the Eurodollar option pit. And it can, in fact, you know, we still have four or five people in the Eurodollar option pit. Believe it or not, the Eurodollar option pit is alive and well. 90 plus percent of the volume trades in the pit. Um, much to my surprise. But we do the same thing in natural gas and crude oil and lots of different commodities. Then we have risk-taking businesses. So that's frequently, um, that's generally business units where we're not providing liquidity, we're not responding to what other people want to do. Instead, we're waiting, we're looking for dislocations, we're looking for places where we can put on trades that have positive expected value. And that could be a treasury basis trade um, where there's a perpetual mispricing and we might put on a big spread between cash and futures and keep it on for months and just manage around the variance and the risk. It could be in, in the energy markets where we think that there's, you know, a, a certain spread is out of line with the fundamentals of the market. At the other end of the spectrum, we have what I call latency-sensitive trading. Some people call it high-frequency trading. And, and there we're very active, constantly in the market, lots of algorithms running. We um, have built, invested very heavily in infrastructure to squeeze the latency out. And, and really, DRW is unique in that we have you know, these three different different styles of trading all in one place. I really like it because I enjoy thinking about different things and trying to solve different problems. Uh, and I think that it gives us a competitive advantage because we really encourage people to communicate across the firm and to share knowledge. And, um, and it's a lot of fun. So I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about uh, just a couple thoughts about what I see kind of going forward. Um, you know, there are some frustrating things going on in the industry. Terry talked about Dodd-Frank and the implementation of, of Dodd-Frank. Um, that's been certainly, that's created a big regulatory burden. 
but it's also created opportunities. And one of the things that we're starting to see is that uh, one of the key parts of the, of the financial aspects of Dodd-Frank was that if a swap can be cleared, it must be cleared. And it was funny, I, I spent entirely too much time going to Washington when they were writing Dodd-Frank and then when they were doing the rule writing. And, um, and I asked the woman who worked for Barney Frank, who was kind of charged with writing the law, what do you think the difference is between a swap and the future? A swap and a future. And she said, she got really angry. She said, everybody knows that. Swaps are risky. And, and so the result is that this whole legislation is based on this complete misunderstanding of financial markets, but they made it as hard as possible to trade a swap and they gave futures a clear competitive advantage. And so we're just in the early stages of starting to see the impact of that. And, and that is gonna create lots of opportunities in, for the futures industry and is why I think that the next three years will be very exciting. Thank you very much.